All right, well, thank everyone for coming. Uh, my name is David Blevins, and uh, I'm one of the creators of uh, Apache Tommy. We actually have a handful of them here this uh, week here at DevOps. It's pretty exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, before I sort of get into the, uh, the, to the presentation, uh, uh, questions for the audience. So, who uses Tomcat? Okay, pretty much 100% of the room. Not surprising. Uh, who also uses something like uh, Glassfish or JBoss or WebSphere, WebLogic? And that looks like it's about uh, about three fourths of the room, which is uh, which is the pretty much the standard response that I see. It's always it's always the same thing, and it, it, you typically get as far as you can on Tomcat, and you sort of hit a brick wall, and then you often have to use another server. And, uh, and that's kind of the problem that we're, that we're trying to solve with Tommy, is basically uh, fill that void uh, that has been around Tomcat for a very long time. If you may ever made the mistake of asking if Tomcat supported EJBs on the Tomcat user list, you would know how much of a you know, violent response you might get. No! So I kind of like Steinfeld, no soup for you! It's uh, very much one of those types of experiences. Uh, but meanwhile, when we use Tomcat, we take and we build up all these things and we fill in all these gaps and we end up recreating an app server. And there's actually you know, ne not necessarily anything wrong with that. Uh, it's just that, well, why not have it be fully certified and tested like all of the other app servers? Let's take the app server we're all building and let's actually finish it and let's make it, it on the same par as a JBoss or a Glassfish or a WebSphere WebLogic. So that's what we're trying to do with, uh, with Tommy. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, a lot of times people haven't paid attention or been aware of what's kind of changed in the last few years around Java EE. It tends to be a dirty word or a bad word. And, uh, and so I, when, whenever I'm talking with somebody and they say J2EE, -E, I go, oh, okay, we probably have a thing, few things to talk about. So, uh, so what you missed, uh, what you might have missed in the last few years. So first is uh, uh, Java EE -E has effectively reduced its size by about half, actually. Uh, so I'm on uh, EE6, -E I was on EE6 uh, um, spec. Uh, EE7, uh, I was involved in EJB 3.0, EJB 3.1, and 3.2, sort of informally involved in the CDI specifications. Uh, what I'm trying to say is I really enjoy working on the standards, not because I think Java EE is perfect, because I think if you really like something or if you see something that could be improved, you have two choices. You can complain about it or you can fix it. And uh, so I've chosen the fix-it approach the best that I possibly can, at least, uh, in, in terms of you know, helping out. So here are some of the things that we've done over the last few years. So one, uh, it's not called J2E anymore. That was rebranded back in uh, you know, the Java 1.5 era. Uh, but also, in EE6, we created this thing called the web profile. And basically, you know, people would say Java EE is big and bloated. Well, that's the whole concept of the web profile, to acknowledge that, in fact, yes, over the course of 10 or more years, there's a lot of technologies in Java EE that you probably don't need, and definitely a handful of them we recommend you do not touch at all. So, for example, like Jax RPC. If you know what that is, I feel sorry for you. If you've had to use it at all, I, I, my heart goes out to you. Uh, I had to implement it, so, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a horrific, horrific thing that Jack's WS, uh, you know, uh, obsoleted. And, of course, now REST is really the king of the hill. Uh, Corba, who uses Corba anymore? Any hands? No hands? Okay. You get points for being the only one willing to admit it. Yeah, so these things are in EE, but they're not necessarily part of what I would call a modern stack. And so the web profile is half of the full profile, and what it allows is for uh, uh, vendors to become certified and not have to implement all this legacy stuff. Certified means passing a truckload of tests. So certified is a good thing. Uh, testing is a good thing. I think we've heard a few talks over the last few years about testing being a good thing. Um, also, 
packaging. We've really, really simplified the packaging. I was never a fan of the ear file. I mean, how many jars do you have to put inside of a jar to put inside of another jar to get the app server to deploy the darn thing? I mean, it's really ridiculous. I mean, it's like Russian dolls. It's like you, op you know, it's like you have an ear file. Oh, look, I got a war file and a bunch of more jars in there. And oh, look, my war file. There's a jar in there too. That's so cool. Is there a jar in that jar? No. Well, I guess that's someone's getting to that. <laughs> They'll make that. <laughs> So rather than keep going with the uh, packaging inside, packaging inside, packaging inside, packaging, let's like, hey, everyone likes war files. All the tools support them. Let's just put everything in a war file and uh, not have to have the class loader complexity. And uh, let's just do it like that. So after a while of doing this outside the spec, uh, we finally got it inside the spec in uh, Java EE6. And so now you don't need ears pretty much anymore. There's rare cases where you might need one of those. Uh, and then another one that's changed is uh, Java EE is now just really, really testable. Um, in, in EJB 3.1, uh, we got added this requirement. And it was like a little, uh, the requirement was this big, but it sort of had this implication you had to go that far to uh, fulfill it. So the requirement was you have to have an embeddable Java SE compliant EJB implementation. And so what this did is it basically took the most complicated part of all the app servers and made it so it had to run like a, as a plain library in a Java SE VM. So that it was like the last straw. So then all the vendors just said, all right, fine, we'll make the whole thing embeddable. So, uh, you know, Glassfish will now run completely embeddable. JWAS will run completely embeddable. And of course, Tommy as well. Uh, that requirement actually came out of OpenEJB, which is one of the core uh, parts of Tommy, and actually is kind of where, t where Tommy comes from in a lot of regards. Uh, that container was embeddable for many, many years. Um, and then there's also another testing framework out there called Archillion. So who's heard of Archillion? Very good. All right, so that was maybe like 25% of the room. It should be 100% of the room. Uh, so Archillion is like a really great testing framework. And what it allows you to do is write tests that run on the server. And those tests are not tied to the server. And in fact, it's very easy. And many people do run the same tests on multiple servers. And, and uh, why this is advantageous, advantageous uh, why this is useful, even if uh, you only have one server, is a lot of times uh, you want to run this, the test against, say, like an embedded server that I just mentioned. We all have embedded servers now. They run in your, they run in your IDE, and you don't need a separate process. It's sort of like uh, how useful an embedded database is. It's not always fun to have to set up and install a database and then share it when you want to run a test, and somebody else is running tests, and you're smacking on the same database. That's not fun. So we have embedded, embedded databases, and then we have embedded servers. So they have Archillion adapters for all these different types of servers, so that test will run on all those different types of uh, setups. So typically, you'll develop against an embedded server, and then when you, you have those tests, you can rerun them on QA, and you can run them again on production. Archillion is very awesome. And if you're in a situation where you have to actually support your application on multiple servers, it's a dream come true for you. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Definitely check that out. So there are some very, very, uh, you know, highlight changes. Lighter, simplified packaging, uh, Java SE friendly, easy to test. Those were some of the bigger complaints about Java EE. So what's Tommy? So Tommy is Tomcat, and we, the name comes from Tomcat plus Java EE equals Tommy. Uh, we like to pronounce it Tommy as the name, you know, Thomas, uh, Tommy. So it's not Tom E.E. -E. Uh, and that's, you know, just a little fun thing we like to do. It's sort of like Nginx is called Nginx, not Nginx. You know, so, uh, so that's how you know the people who have seen a presentation. Or they, they, they say, oh, have you heard about Tom E.E.? -E? It's like, yeah, I have. It's Tommy. Uh, so it's web profile certified. Uh, so we do go beyond the web profile in a couple different flavors of Tommy, but the basic there is that it's, uh, it passes the uh, EETCK for the web profile. Uh, E7 work is in progress. Um, it's built from all Apache components, or mostly, I should say. 
Uh, and uh, that's, there's a lot of great projects at Apache, aside from Tomcat, MyFaces, OpenJPA, uh, OpenWebBeans, uh, OpenEJB, of course. Uh, and then I like to say it's the thing we've been building ourselves for the last 10 years. Uh, and so finally now, instead of having to build it yourself and go searching through blog posts and reading the comments section of other people who couldn't get it to work and hoping the reason you couldn't get it to work was their reason they couldn't get it to work, and then hoping you don't find, oh, I found a, the, the, the solution. That's the worst. When you like searching in a forum and you have that problem and you come across the other person who had that problem three years earlier and their follow-up post is fixed it. It's like, that's terrible. So that's kind of the, what we, what the world we live in with Tomcat is that, you know, who's written the JSP in the last five years? Okay, last two years. You know, s some hands, maybe 10% maybe of the hands, 15 percent of the hands, it's, it's not common. And who's writing like a ton of just straight up servlets? Not JAXRS, straight up servlets. Yeah, I think maybe one hand went up. But we, we adore Tomcat for its simplicity, right? And all the tools support Tomcat and it's a really great basis. So what we do with Tommy, how we build it basically is, uh, is we, we take a Tomcat zip file, we extract it. We add in these libraries like uh, OpenJPA, MyFaces, OpenWebBean, so basically CDI, My, uh, JSF. We add in uh, the integration code required to truly get them all together. And when I say integration code, read e.g. all the blog posts you don't have to go find and read and grab that guy's code from their website. We add all the integration code and we zip it back up and then we call that Tommy. We run it through the TCK, comes out the other end completely certified, and now we have a Java E implementation of Tomcat. And, uh, and so it's great. It works with all the Tomcat tools and I'll show it uh, working with, uh, with Eclipse. Uh, here's a little chart. This is on a website. This is actually readable because DevOps has great projection systems, but basically Tomcat is up there with servlets and JSP, and then that first column is the web profile. That second column is effectively the web profile in EE7. We added a uh, JAXRS to the web profile. It somehow didn't make it in. It was a, it's a little bit short-sighted of us. Uh, and then Tommy Plus is effectively uh, the web profile plus JMS, which is very useful. Um, and Jax WS, which is also very useful to many people, and uh, the connector architecture, which a lot of people have never, uh, or maybe have heard of, but never really seen. So if we get to it, I'll show you a little bit of a cool stuff that we've, been, we've done with it. Uh, it's actually one of those APIs that has a really cool potential that has never been reached, and we did some work with it in E7 to kind of like re-energize it. So I'll see if I can show that. So we have some basic goals with Tommy. Uh, the first one is be simple. Tomcat is a simple app server. If we made yet another complicated EE app server, I think no one would be interested in it. I certainly wouldn't. Uh, the world does not need any more complicated app servers. Not that the other servers are horrible, but Tomcat is just really, really simple. There doesn't, Tomcat doesn't have domains, doesn't have any of these complicated uh, architecture types of things. It's a simple class loader. Web app class loaders, done. And uh, it's real basic. And so uh, the second principle is uh, be Tomcat. So if uh, it comes to be the choice of, well, you know, we're going to, we have a better way of doing, you know, JNDI, for example. No, we're not. We're going to use the Tomcat way. Oh, we have a better way of doing security. No, we're going to use the Tomcat way of security. So, for example, all of the EE concepts that are required around security have all been written to work on top of the Tomcat Realm API because there are like a million Realm implementations. There's a JDBC Realm, there's an LDAP Realm, there's a Jazz Realm, there's a, every kind of Realm you ever imagine, and a lot of people have custom Realms for Tomcat. So all the EE security concepts work right out of the box on top of the Tomcat Realm. So if you want to use WS security, well, you can log in to your user in your Tomcat Realm without having to set up anything. It's there, already configured, right out of the box. Um, and as well, if you have an app that works in Tomcat and it doesn't work in Tommy for some reason, we consider it to be breaking that tenant 
v tomcat. So it's, we consider that to be a very serious bug. And if that's the case, if you're finding a situation like that, let us know and we will absolutely fix it. Uh, and then, of course, be certified. So it's got to be compliant. So that way, if you have an app that works on JBoss or GlassFish, you can move it to Tommy or vice versa. If you have an app that works on Tommy and you want to move it on to WebLogic or WebSphere or JBoss, GlassFish, whatever, it's fine. Those things can port now. Okay, so a note about certification. Certification is not a aspect of, tech, of the you know, EE that we often think about because basically there's this test suite that all the vendors have to pass and they're, to get it, they had to become a, a Java EE licensee. This is like a whole legal process. So Apache is a EE licensee. And uh, so this test suite is large. It's tens of thousands of tests and to run it all the way through takes about a week. And uh, so it's no small feat to be certified. It's not heaps and heaps of code that you have to write to certify something. You just have to write the right code. And uh, that is a, a, a process. So taking all these standard components that we would normally put in Tomcat ourselves and then hooking that up to the TCK and starting to run the test, you know, we weren't, uh, you know, we were like maybe 20 to 40 percent uh, complete and, uh, you know, small. The amount of time it took us to get all the way through all these tens of thousands of tests was like about 10 months, maybe nine. So it's no small feat. The other, what comes out the other side is not very big. So Tommy Web Profile is 127 or 128 megabytes in, in download size. And in uh, JVM footprint, we passed the TCK without increasing the default JVM memory. So it's, you know, a hello world heap size. So it's pretty tiny. It's not small. We haven't ruined Tomcat. Tomcat's very light, and we keep Tommy as very light. Uh, but the result is, is that if you have an app that you've been wanting to move on to Tomcat, but you couldn't because you would have to rewrite the whole thing because Tomcat doesn't support all these things, well, now you can just move it straight over. As well, there's no real need to have, uh, you know, all these different types of architecture. I think you know, the most critical thing that, I, uh, that uh, we really wanted to change about the IT industry kind of in general is that if you look at the last 10 years, the way we've been doing things, you kind of have two camps. You have like the Jetty Tomcat camp, and you have everybody else that's a certified server like a JBoss, GlassFish, WebSphere, WebLogic, and they don't overlap, and they don't connect, and people, every time you start a new project, you have the fight. We're going to go this way, or we're going to go that way. And somebody wins and somebody loses. And why? Like, why can't both teams win? If you want to use Tomcat and you want all those EE features, why not have them in the same box? And then everybody gets what they want. Um, yeah, so we did our testing on, uh, we do our testing on Amazon EC2. So uh, uh, we will spin up like a ton of T1 micro instances that have about 613 megabytes of memory each. And uh, then we run all the tests in like 100 of these, and we get through the whole TCK in about an hour and a half. So what would normally take a week to run linearly, we can get done in an hour and a half. And this is just as an FYI, uh, this is kind of a different way of thinking, because I mean, we're an open source project. We don't have like 60 engineers, you know? We, we can't afford to have somebody who just, just runs a test for our job. We, we want everyone coding, right? So anyway, so we, we've uh, taken that uh, approach. Uh, we've also started running uh, the tests on Raspberry Pi, which is kind of fun. Um, Stephen Jansen, uh, he, uh, he's got a talk accepted at Java 1 about, uh, he did an IoT type of thing where he took a Raspberry Pi and he put Tommy on it, and then he made like a little REST type of a, uh, application that would control a scoreboard of a basketball game. So it's pretty cool. He's got a talk on it, and it's really great to see. It's at about 10 minutes. It's fun to see the problems that he ran into, like human synchronization, like both people will increment the score at the same time, and then that will be wrong, and one will have to you know, decrement it. And so he did all sorts of uh, interesting things. And uh, with the uh, you know, scoreboard, they had the buttons there, and, uh, and uh, sometimes the, the, they first used a phone, and they had a, you know, button on the phone, the button would send a rest call, but sometimes the, f the cell service would go down. And so, and so they actually had situations where they needed to stop the game and it wouldn't stop. 
Anyway, it's really cool talk. But yeah, it's all running on Raspberry Pi with an EE server. And if we, we rewind to 2006, probably all, we all would have laughed at the concept of having an EE server on a device that small. It would be like, oh, that's overkill. No, but we make them so tiny these days. Not just Tommy, but JBoss is very light these days, and a lot of them are, are very small. Uh, so here are the components that are inside uh, Tommy. Uh, satisfying the web profile requirements. Uh, we do have another flavor of Tommy coming out uh, where we use uh, kind of more glassfish uh, componentry and that's really just to make it a little easier for people <coughs> to uh, port their apps from glassfish to Tommy if they needed support and Oracle no longer provides it. Uh, then now you can, uh, you know, JSF is kind of hard to test so it's nice to be able to use Mohara versus MyFaces if you were previously using Mohara. Um, and so, yeah, so we run that through the web profile TCK as well, and it's, and it's certified. Uh, but the coolest thing about Tommy, in my opinion, is the community. So this is a picture of, uh, of a bunch of us that we got together, and uh, this is 2011 in Tours France, and I'm mentioning this because this is actually, this week at Jev DevOx is actually the third time we've all, be, all n that these people in this picture have been in the same room together in the last, like, five years. So the first time was 2011. We took vacation to get them together for a week and hack together. You rarely find that kind of enthusiasm and passion. Open source is pretty awesome like that. We did it again in uh, 2012 in Munich. And so 2014, DevOx is the third time. Uh, so yay, open source. It's pretty awesome. OK, let me show you some code. All right, uh, who uses Eclipse? Okay, that's like 80% of the room, as, as predicted. Okay, I'm gonna set up um, Eclipse in Tommy using the Tomcat web adapter. So I'm going to extract Eclipse from scratch because I think it's cheating when people show you demos that are really kind of cool but you don't get to see them set it up. You're like, what did you have to do before you came in the room to make that awesomeness work? Eclipse. Okay. And uh, not that the text is, the tar output is important, but that's f fairly readable, I think. Okay, so I'll start that up and I'll extract Tommy for the first time. So I'm going to show you Tommy Plus, which I mentioned has basically everything in there. So I'm going to show you the heaviest version of Tommy. I think it's sort of cheating when people show you that their lightest version, like we have a light version, I'll show it to you, it's very light, and then you're like, what's the head one look like? So we're going to show you the biggest version. Plus. All right. So I'm extracting that, and then we'll just, I'll just give you a little command line to here just so you can see where did I extract it right there okay yeah it's because I got it there we go so it's a uh, pretty much the same layout you see in a standard Tomcat install there's a bin directory it's got the uh, same old shell scripts that you normally see uh, like I say we literally extract the Tomcat uh, zip add the libraries, we actually add a server listener into the server XML file, and then the whole, th we zip it back up. So we haven't, we don't remove anything. That's the key thing. We do not want to remove anything from Tomcat. All right, so the first thing you do when you set up, uh, and these, all these steps will be very familiar if you use uh, Tomcat and Eclipse on a regular basis. We make ourselves a workspace in the temp directory, so we're making ourselves a fresh one. And we say new dynamic web project. And let me make a, a minor note here, or major note. Do not select enterprise application project. That will give you that big complicated ear garbage that I mentioned earlier. They're gone. They're dead. 
Uh, just select dynamic web project like you always do. Okay. And we'll call it DevOps Uck. And we'll say new runtime. And then you click Tomcat 7. Say next. Browse to where you extracted Tommy. And you just simply say open. And we'll actually put a little tag on here just so we know that this is uh, the Java EE version of Tomcat. And then we just say finish. And we can take all the defaults from there. Finish. OK. So now we have a basic uh, little workspace here. Uh, we'll make ourselves some code. So we'll say new servlet. Oops, can't type. Really can't type. Say hello servlet. And of course, it's a Java package. I do that every single time. All right, and then we say finish. And of course, Eclipse loves to generate boilerplate code. It's, uh, I, did, did anyone get paid by the line of code? Uh, you should use Eclipse if you, if you do. All right, so we're gonna delete this all because it just makes things more confusing rather than, uh, I mean, Seriously, any Java doc you can generate should not exist. It's, it, it's worse than having no Java doc because then no one will write Java doc because they think they have Java doc. I mean, don't even get me started. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is just uh, generate some basic uh, output here. Let's set the content type. Text. HTML, and then we'll just add some, some output. Okay. Hello, servlet, grammatically correct with an R in there. All right. And an, all right. So now to run this on the server, we just right click on the component, say run as, run on server. This is the same thing we always do. We're going to click that little button on there so we don't have to see this dialog box every time we run on the server. And then we just say finish. And it will boot up Tommy and uh, package up our little war and deploy it into the server. And then it should pop up and hello servlet. There we go. So that was Tommy booting up and running and deploying the servlet. So it's pretty much the same speed we see on Tomcat on a regular basis. Uh, so, so far we haven't done anything you can't already do on Tomcat. So let's go off the rails a little bit. Uh, we're going to uh, make uh, an EJB. So we'll say new class and we'll call it Hello, Bean, and we'll say finish. And we'll annotate this as a Java XEJB singleton. And then oops. somehow I forgot to write how to write Java code. OK, Java X, and we'll put a local view on this one. There we go. OK. We'll give it a basic method, public string, hello, and we'll have it return hello EJB. OK. And now we can get this injected into the servlet just by making a private field of type hello bean. with the V. And we annotate it with at JavaX EJB EJB. 
Okay, and what that will do is it, tell, it will tell Tommy to uh, inject the hello bean into our servlet when the servlet's created. And we'll actually update our output. Come on. Oh, I called it bean. Yep. Okay, and then I save it, and Eclipse should notice at some point that the application has been changed and redeploy the server, redeploy the app. There, there, they're redeployed. And then we can go to our uh, output, and boom. Hello servlet, hello EJB. We haven't had to add any third-party libraries. We haven't had to chase down any blog posts and we haven't had to add any XML configuration files. All the things we do on a very regular basis when we write applications on a Tomcat because of the lack of functionality in it, which is fine because Tomcat's very simple, but there's less motivation for us to do that when those things are in the box. Um, so there's a lot more here. So let's go ahead and uh, do some rest. Or let's go backwards. Let's do Jax WS, then rest. JWS. So we add one annotation on our bean, save it, and, Eclip and Eclipse should notice the project has changed. Yep, and it redeployed. So uh, maybe a little bit difficult for you to see in the back, but on our log output, uh, we will post the location of the web service. There it is. And that's just to save you from having to Google around or where we might have put it. And then we can go like this. And then we have full wisdom from our bean and the ability to invoke it over SOAP. And as I mentioned, web service security and stuff like that, all of this stuff is working out of the box. Again, no libraries. This is CXF, by the way. So if you are using CXF and you're using Tomcat, well, your glue's done for you. You can, you know, you got a new platform team that will take care of that for you. It's called Apache. And uh, they'll, they'll do that work for you these days. All right. So, we've just seen JAXWS, and so let's go ahead and do some rest on this component here. And we'll call it, you know, rest. Very clever. <laughs> really original name. And we'll make this a get method. I rely too heavily on command completion for very little gain. That was actually the same number of characters. Okay. And then we save it, and it should notice that it's changed, and it has. And so we actually will print the, uh, all of the rest information here in the bottom. There's the, uh, the service itself, and then, of course, we, if we have additional gets, puts, and deletes, they'll all be listed here as well. So we'll grab this, go to our browser, and then we say hello, we see hello EJB. Now, the default MIME type for REST so for service is text plain, so that's why we don't see any JSON or anything like that. But if you had a, a complex object and it had an, the right annotations on it, you would see JSON out of there, and you want to add any libraries, do any blog post hunting. Modern development without having the you know, keep, the thing that's crazy is that most web apps are like 10, 20 megs in size before you even write a single line of code because of the, if they're written on Tomcat, because of the amount of libraries we, we pull from our previous project to our next project, just so we don't have to, uh, you know, spend the time throwing all that stuff together again. We end up carrying these all forward, and it's, it's, it's a, a little bit of work. All right.
So let's let's see some cooler stuff. Uh, this is this is obviously very cool. I mean, uh, like I say, this this is a web app that has uh, you know JAXRS, JAXWS, servlets, EJB, and there's two Java classes in zero third-party libraries and zero XML files. So we cannot understate how simple that is. I mean, did did anyone notice that uh, it was all really heavy? Yeah, I, I actually, we haven't seen it deploy. This has just been a time machine. We actually have to do a trick here, and it actually took a half an hour each deploy, but it's like an alien abduction thing. You don't notice the missing time, but when you get out of here, it'll be 5 o'clock, and you won't know why. Okay. All right, so let's show, show some of the... Uh, some of the embedded stuff, because I think that stuff is really cool. Uh, okay. I'll do the stateless, simple stateless. And there we go. All right, so this is kind of a really basic uh, stateless session being kind of project. And again, should open that up into IntelliJ as soon as IntelliJ wants to notice. There we go. All right. So I had mentioned that Java E was testable, and I think that kind of statement is very, very, very thin without any kind of backup uh, for it. So here we have a simple project. It's got one bean and one test class and uh, just some Maven build files, but there's no Java E XML or anything like that in here. And so what we have is a real simple stateless being that can do math. It's a plain old Java object with an annotation on it. And, uh, you know, add, subtract, multiply. We have a test case. And the test case will boot an embedded container uh, in the setup. And then it will look up and execute the bean. And uh, there we go. We have all these test methods that once the bean's been looked up, it'll just run, add, subtract, multiply. And we can run this in our IDE without any plugins, uh, just because this is all plain old libraries. And actually, IntelliJ takes longer than the test will take. And boom. So we ran five tests in two seconds. So that's not exactly heavy. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, this is EJB, and I understand EJB has cooties and it's icky, but it's sort of like getting kids to eat their vegetables. Doesn't matter what they taste like, they're icky, and no one's going to want to use them anymore. After, after a certain point of time, the reputation gets so bad. But really, we have plain old Java code. And the coolest thing about it is that this is all remote server free. There's none of that complexity. It's all plain. Java SE stuff, it uses EE APIs, but it's still all run and developed in an SE fashion. So if we wanted to throw a breakpoint in our bean and then run our test again with debug, well, we can totally do that. There we go. So now we can look at the stack and we can see oh, A is 12 and B is 6 and we can do all sorts of fun things with our IDE like evaluate expression, what will happen if we take A minus B, what will the results be? Hmm. Come on. There we go, 6. So yeah, it's pretty cool. These are the types of things that normally you do without when you're writing some kind of EE app. Why? You shouldn't have to do it without. You should want to develop uh, Java EE apps the same way you develop any Java application. In the comfort of your IDE, with a plain Java SE feel, and not have to be surrounded by plugins and tools. I'm really anti-plugins and tools. It's, it's not natural. Anytime you need so many plugins and tools just to do real simple tasks, you kinda, you've probably taken a wrong turn in the technology itself. Now that's not your fault, that's the technology's fault. That's just why we're changing Java E, so that it can be used 
much more simply and in, 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 in plain fashion. Um, so there's a bunch of cool stuff uh, that's there. I'm gonna, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to show... Uh, we're always doing stuff to uh, try and you know, make things uh, more interesting and uh, add neat ideas into the space. So here's one that, uh, that we kind of hacked on, and we're still hacking on it. Uh, so I had mentioned that connectors uh, were a really cool thing, but have never really uh, been kind of noticed. Uh, and so a uh, couple of things. Who's heard of MDBs? Okay, message-driven beams. Basically, these were, you know, JMS consumers, right? So most people thought these, we, we, our knowledge of them over the last 10 years has been that they're asynchronous and they're, that they're JMS-based. When in fact, they can be synchronous and in fact, they're not even JMS-based. So what happened was they were introduced in EJB 2.0 and uh, as JMS only, then in EGB 2.1, we actually abstracted them and put them behind this, this uh, spec called the connector architecture. So they actually effectively became connector-driven beams at that moment. We just didn't really advertise that or tell anybody. And so the, uh, the perception of them remained that they were JMS bound. And so although you could potentially do some very cool things with the connector architecture, uh, it never really took on. It was never really widely. It was. It's, a, it's like a 300-page spec. It's really. It's, it's really complicated to read. But when it really boils down to it, to write a connector is very simple. So what a connector does is basically, you know, in EE they say you're not allowed to start threads and you're not allowed to open sockets and you're not allowed to do this, that, and the other thing. You can do all of those things in a connector. And a connector starts when the server starts and a connector stops when the server stops. You're effectively and literally extending the server. And with a connector, you can open sockets, you can receive requests via your own protocol that you could possibly make up, or you could use uh, you know, some client library like uh, you know, a Jabber uh, client library or whatever. And then when you get a message, you get to invoke the bean, and the container will do all the transaction management and all the injection and the instance creation, so you get to do the fun part and let all the boring IOC stuff that's been, take, you know, kind of a snooze, uh, nothing, and you don't have to do any of that part. So, so here's a little connector that actually will allow us to use Telnet and log into the server itself and invoke beans as commands. And uh, so let's just take a look at the, at the beans itself themselves. So we just annotate the bean with at message driven, and then actually we have a, an, a little API we've hacked up. All the code for the API is right here in this project. It's not a, a standard thing. The standard thing is the fact that we can create connectors. So we've made ourselves, I'll show the imports. There we go. Come on. Come on. Button's too small. Standing at a very awkward angle for clicking. Okay. So all these, are, uh, all these classes are right here in this project. So there's not a single import aside from this one annotation. And so this whole API is of our creation. And that, that's what I'm saying. The power is that you can basically do all sorts of crazy cool things. Whatever you can imagine is actually possible. Uh, so. We have a basic pattern. We annotate methods with at command, and then they'll show up in the console when someone types help. And then if someone types, uh, say, GC, we'll execute this method, and then we will run the garbage collector. We have other commands like free memory and max memory and total memory, and all they do is basically report uh, the memory settings. So let's go ahead and boot this thing up. So actually, I'm kind of cheating. Uh, I'm using Archelion to, uh, to assemble my app and run it in the server uh, just because it's, it's convenient. Connectors are the one last thing where you still would need an ear file. 
and uh, that's in the top of my to-do list for EE8 to get that uh, uh, fixed. We just got this connector improvement into EE7 uh, just by that much. Um, all right. So here, let me, let me exit and then, all right, come on. Uh, that way you can see the telnet at the top. There we go. I got this guy open. Okay. So I've just logged into my Java process, and if I type help, I see a bunch of commands. And uh, this is just some console-y type of code that I've written. Uh, and these commands correspond to the MDBs that I have deployed in my server and the at commands method. And so if I type, for example, free memory, it shows me 283 megabytes. And that's because I've got this little code over here with this little basic command stuff and if I want to add another command on here and we'll say let's call it DevOps Is that really, I'm making up a word, I guess, awesomest. That's good. Originality. Got to have points for originality. So we'll redeploy our app. Boom. And now we see DevOx in the list of commands, which is right there in the bottom. And then we see at the bottom, DevOps is the most awesomest. So it's pretty crazy. You could do uh, an email connector. You could do uh, an FTP connector. I mean, any protocol that you might want to imagine you could have come into your server. And uh, I, you know, the, the importance of that, I think, can't be understated because I, I kind of feel like we're abusing HTTP by using it for absolutely everything all the time, even though it may not fit just because it's, it feels very ubiquitous, but there are so many good protocols that have already existed for a long time, and you may want to consume messages from those, but we end up doing weird things like, uh, well, we're going to have it go to this server, this server is going to clean it up, and then it will make a REST call in our service. It's like, we could cut a layer out of that, and layers cost money. Someone's got to maintain it. You know, why not? Why not think differently? Why use HTTP for absolutely everything? You don't have to anymore. You can write your own. Uh, and, and the coolest thing about this is it deploys in an ear file. And so if you're on a cloud platform that supports Glassfish or JBoss or Tommy, uh, you can do you know, Telnet in the cloud. Now, I wouldn't do Telnet. We have an SSH version of this that we're, that we're hacking on. Uh, and our, our, our friend John here and our you know, uh, fellow Tommy committer uh, he just got it. He just got the authentication part of the SSH part of it working. So all these same commands would work uh, in SSH. So you could deploy this up in like Jelastic, for example, and then SSH in and like see your actual runtime server. And you know you could write your own administration beans, so that you don't have to write console. You don't have to write GUI in, you know faces for you know for this. Or if you wrote REST, then you're all, then you're back at your command line, wrapping all these things with curls so and scripts so you can make them execute really cleanly. Or you can just go straight into the server and execute them there. I mean, think differently. It's, there's, you don't, everything doesn't always have to be done in the exact same way. You can do things in a little bit different way. Uh, so I probably have maybe three minutes left for questions. But yeah, let's, let's uh, who has any thoughts, any questions? No? Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, there are annotations for most things. The question was, let me repeat, sorry about that. The question was configuration. 
the, mo the nice thing about using a web server is you usually don't have to, don't, don't have to configure a lot of things, um, like data sources. And so you can put your data source in your context XML uh, like you can with Tomcat, so that works. Uh, we also have an additional uh, XML file called resources XML that looks uh, pretty simple. Um, and that will allow you to, I, mean, I don't know if I have an example of it right in front of me. Uh, and then you can put that in your web app and, you know, I have all the configuration inside your web app if you want to do things with XML. You don't have to. In EE6, we added uh, this concept of uh, data source definition which is an annotation that allows you to even do data sources inside the, oh, I'm not in the test directory. Uh, I can't find it. This is a magic way to find classes in GitHub. I can't remember what it is. Uh, whatever. It's at data source definition. It's a standard annotation now. And if you need to use topics and queues in EE7, there is at uh, topic definition and at connection factory definition. Now, in Tommy, we will create all that stuff for you automatically if you don't configure it. We're not, we, do, we, we, we try extremely hard to deploy your app without any configuration at all. There are really no situations where we will fail your app and say you haven't configured something. So if you have a JMS app, for example, and it's got 10 topics and, and you go to deploy that in Tommy and you haven't created one, you haven't changed the config file one line, you will still deploy the app. Because odds are you are using like JNDI to look up the app or you have at uh, resource and it says, you know, private topic orange. All right, well, you want a topic called orange. There you go, you got a topic called orange. So we'll log that we made a topic called orange, and then therefore you can uh, go ahead and evaluate and test the, all the stuff, and don't have to do this huge investment up front. We're very anti-complexity in that regard. Uh, so our config files are that big, and you, you only need to add them uh, when you want things to be different than the default. So that's sort of a uh, convention over uh, configuration philosophy that we have that's very deep uh, into the project. Uh, any other questions? No? All right, so one last thing. There's a bunch of uh, tools that support Tommy, so thank you to all these vendors for adding uh, Tommy support uh, in their platforms. So Jelastic is here presenting this week, or here, th or not here, uh, uh, IntelliJ, I should say. Uh, Hazelcast, we're starting to do some cool things with Hazelcast. Uh, they have a booth next to ours, and of course, uh, Tommy Tribe is the company that we started to basically give a home to the passionate people I showed very early in the in the session, and and uh, so yeah, we're big we're big fans of open source and uh, big believers in it, and yeah, we love Java E, we love to make things simpler, and we like to add new cool stuff. So I really hope that you check out Tommy. Uh, it's very much worth it. And if, especially if you're using any kind of Tomcat development, it's a natural fit. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the session.